Hey everybody, this is Christian and today I want to talk about my Kubernetes setup, especially some of the deployment configs and security settings that I've recently improved. Because this is an area I haven't paid too much attention to in the past, yeah, I always just focused on getting stuff working on the cluster instead of making it secure and reliable. But once you start getting more into the advanced Kubernetes field, when you're using it in your day-to-day -day work, maybe as a software developer or cloud architect, or you just want to make your own Kubernetes cluster at home better, you should really start looking into these things. Try to analyze how you're running it and how you can improve the stability and security of your workloads. This is exactly what we are doing in this video. I've used the free and open source tool the tree to help me improving my deployments and I also had the chance to review their new feature that scans your entire Kubernetes cluster to provide you a complete overview of it. It's absolutely amazing to quickly find out where are the problems in your setup. In my example there were many problems, yeah, let's be honest. But but I wanted to improve that and learn more about the best practices in Kubernetes and I managed to fix some of these problems and that's what we'll have a look at as well. So I hope you will enjoy it. But uh, before we start looking into my Kubernetes clusters and the actual workloads, I quickly want to recap what was my workflow before, because in the past I've already used DataTree CLI, which is a free and open source tool to validate Kubernetes deployments. You can run it directly in your terminal to check your desired YAML files against predefined and even custom policies. These policies cover many security checks and best practices, and the tool will highlight any failures in your files and explain how you can fix the these problems. I've shown you this in uh, previous tutorials about Kubernetes, so some of you might already know it, and it's a phenomenal tool to learn more about Kubernetes best practices and ensure you don't have any misconfigurations or yeah, you don't deploy containers with security vulnerabilities in your cluster. But to be honest, I haven't always used this tool to validate my files. <laughs> That's the problem with CLI tools. You can use them, but you don't have to. And when you're lazy like me and you sometimes forget to run it in your pipelines or in your workflows, this is obviously a big problem. Also, when you're working in a larger organization with different developer teams where many people are deploying workloads, it is hard to keep the visibility about what is going on in your Kubernetes cluster and how the existing resources are actually created. Because you never know which policy your team members have used to validate their deployments? Did they just skip any important checks or maybe they didn't do any validation at all? And that's why the developers of the tree came up with a new approach and that is installing the tree as a webhook in Kubernetes which regularly scans the entire cluster and run a policy check on all the namespaces and all the objects that are existing there. And it will give you a posture score as a quick indication of how many objects are failing these checks and visualize it in a nice and clean web interface. As you can see, I've currently connected five Kubernetes clusters to my DataTree account. Every cluster is running the webhook and constantly running these policy checks. Whenever I deploy new stuff on my clusters, it will tell me whether this posture score has increased or decreased since the last check. And that is really great to keep track of what is going on and quickly find out if there are any problems in your deployments that might need your attention. Of course, you can also inspect the scanned namespaces as well, uh, get a deep insight into which rules were failing, which objects are affected, and it will give you a great how-to on how to fix these problems, just like the CLI tool of the tree, but with a bit more power. <laughs> Of course, we will have a look later on my Kubernetes clusters, which specific problems there were existing and how I've managed to fix some of these issues. But just to let you know, if you want to install the webhook on your cluster, this can be done very easily. You just need to log into your DataTree account and then click on add cluster. This will present you some instructions on how to install the webhook with a simple helm command. You just need to add the helm repository to your workstation and then deploy it with an access token that is directly created and managed in your DataTree account. And then the tree will deploy all the necessary workloads on your cluster. Once this is all running, you should see a new cluster appearing in the web interface and you can now start digging into the policies and rules. By the way, this will work no matter if this is an on-premise cluster or if it's running in the cloud. There is no incoming connection needed for any of these services. The tree will always connect from inside the cluster to the cloud infrastructure, so it's very easy and straightforward to use it. 
Just to let you know, while the free and open source community version of the tree is free forever, there are some of these advanced features that require a license. It's actually depending on how many nodes you're running on Kubernetes. So if you want to use some of these advanced features in your company environment to enforce Kubernetes policies or similar things, just reach out to the Datree team. Of course, you will find a link in the description of this video. Okay, so let's also take a quick look at the policies and customizations of these checks because Datree comes with many predefined policies that you can customize to create your own set of checks that you want to run on your workloads. In my default policy that I'm running on most of my clusters, I for example enable most of the container checks. These involve many best practices like ensure each container has a configured memory and CPU limit, the liveness and readiness probes or a pinned tagged version. So these checks make all a lot of sense for running containers, but there are also many other useful things in the NSA section for example. These involve things like prevent containers from escalating privileges, prevent them from running as root, or ensure they have a read-only file system. That is very good to make sure your workloads are deployed in a secure way and it helps you to protect against exploitation. You can of course also create multiple policies where you enable or disable checks for specific environments. For example, I'm sometimes running a single node Kubernetes cluster in my home lab and in this policy I've disabled all the checks that require applications or workloads to run more than one replica because this really doesn't make any sense in a single node cluster. Now let's also dive a bit deeper into the actual problems I had on my Kubernetes clusters. For example, on the Cube Demo 4 Kubernetes cluster, you can see this has still the posture score D and almost half of the checks here are failing. And while some of these checks might not be as terrible as other ones, I wanted to increase the posture score as much as I can, not because it's all necessary, but because it's a great choice to learn how to do it right. For example, this check here, the Ensure deployment has a configured ENV label. This is failing on all namespaces on this cluster. It isn't a critical one because it's not doing anything for securing the workloads, but having an environment label is useful for filtering deployments according to their stage. That's what the Datree's documentation tells us. And you could also easily fix this issue by just adding this specific label. Note, Datree will not only tell you why this check has failed in your cluster, it also gives you a good explanation why this setting could be useful to fix, how difficult it probably is for you to fix, this is indicated with this rule fix complexity level from easy to hard. And this gives you some additional reference on these problems with some really good examples. Now, of course, I wanted to fix this specific ENV label problem and I just need to add this ENV label in my deployment manifest. For example, in my Nginx deployment, I could just add it to the metadata section, set this environment to demo and that's it. Because this check was failing in all the namespaces, I needed to do that for all applications. In Argo CD, for example, I could just edit the existing manifest with the kubectl tools, but I'm also running a couple of Helm charts in my Kubernetes cluster, and here you don't manage the manifests directly because it's all done by Helm. And when you're using Helm in Kubernetes, it always depends on whether the Helm chart gives you the ability to set specific configurations or not. You just need to take a look at the corresponding Helm chart values. In most of the charts, it's pretty simple to add the ANV label. For example, the traffic helm chart has a section in the deployment called labels. And here you can just add any custom label you want, such as the ENV label. And that's then added to all the deployments. Also, most of the other charts I am using had the ability to do that. Uh, but there were, of course, many other issues that I needed to fix. For example, one thing that is probably a bit more important than the ENV label is the readiness and liveness probe. These were separate checks that were failing, but I'll just consider this as one problem. Because the readiness and liveness probes allow Kubernetes to determine whether a pod is healthy and is ready to accept traffic. If you don't set these two checks in your workloads, it could result in unavailable applications, which you don't want to have, of course. This is, according to the tree, a bit more difficult to fix. That's why the rule complexity level is set to hard. And that is actually true, because it can't be fixed by just adding a simple enabled statement in the manifest. You need to find out for each application you're running how readiness and liveness probes should be configured. Yeah, You can use HTTP requests, you can use TCP requests, or execute specific commands to check whether the application is ready or not. And that all depends, of course, on how the application sends back responses. 
for example, the, an Nginx web server can be checked pretty easily with an HTTP request. On my Nginx server, for example, I could easily set the readiness and liveness probe by just connecting to the root location on port 80. But on other services, that might not be as easy configurable, especially when these are applications that don't have a web interface and therefore they are not answering to HTTP requests or they are deployed via Helm, something like Cert Manager or Argo CD. For some of my applications, I haven't really found a good solution yet, unfortunately, but there is a possibility in that tree to skip some of these checks on namespaces or specific objects, because yeah, sometimes you don't need to run policy checks on core services where you already know, okay, I don't need to run all of these checks there. That's why I have also added a config map that you need to call webhook scanning filters and then deploy it into the namespace where your tree webhook is running. And here I have created a skip list for the following objects, all deployments in the cert manager in Portana namespace, and also some specific objects in the Argo CD namespace that I've configured by name. So, so all the policy checks on my cluster won't run on these specific objects, and it won't be reported in the Datree's web UI. Of course, you need to be careful doing this. Yeah, you should only add objects to the skip list if you really don't need the policy checks there, because it actually doesn't help you if you just add everything to the skip list to just increase the posture score and say, hey, everything is great. <laughs> but you actually never run any policy checks there. So yeah, all of this stuff depends on your environment and what you want to achieve with it. But that's it about the liveness and readiness probe. I believe these two settings are pretty useful for user-facing applications and web services services, but for other core applications you might have some trouble setting it up and therefore you might just want to skip some of these core service namespaces. Let's come to the security checks, because I've also identified three security settings that were missing in some of my workloads. They were a part of the NSA checks in the tree policy, and they are pretty important to harden the container against exploitation and malware. So for example, first the read-only root file system setting, which makes the container's file system read-only, meaning that the container can only read files and cannot write or modify them. This really helps to prevent malicious code from modifying the host system. Or the run as non-root setting that allows a container to run as a root user with full privileges to access and modify the host system. This should only be used for container that need full access to the host system, such as workloads that need access to logs or networking settings. For all the other applications, this poses a security risk if malicious code is able to run inside the container. So that is also something you might disable in workloads. And the last was the low privilege escalation setting. This setting controls whether a container can escalate its privileges to run as a root user. By default, most containers run as non-root users with limited privileges and they should of course not be able to switch that. Theoretically, these three security settings can be easily fixed in the manifest and added to the deployment security context. In Helm charts, it might be a bit different here because you can't directly add them to the deployment. For example, in traffic, you can see that the Helm chart already contains some of these settings here, but they are not configurable. And the Portana Helm chart doesn't have any of these options at all. <laughs> and sometimes I actually don't know whether this was intentional by the developers because the container need to run as root or whether they just have forgot to add this setting in the helm charts. That's why it's not always easy as you might think it is. I also found out that some workloads actually need to run as root or they need read and write access. For example, the Nginx web server that I'm running, there I could just add the allow privilege escalation setting and set it to false. But Nginx also requires access to the container's root file system because it expects to have write access to the etc Nginx directory. And once I added these security settings, the Nginx container failed to start. So again, while all these are great recommendations to increase security in Kubernetes, you need to be aware that it can't be enabled to every workload. It really depends on the application, whether it requires specific privileges or not. But I think you should really pay attention to it and go through your workloads and application and see if you could add a security context. You should be aware of it. 
But apart from the security settings on the containers, there were also some other checks that were failing. Also very difficult to fix. <laughs> For example, the resource requests and limitations on Kubernetes. Just to let you know, this mostly won't be a big deal on a small Kubernetes cluster or in a home lab. But if you're running large clusters, it is useful to have a better control over your resources. The resource requests and limits help to ensure that the application has the resources it needs to run smoothly and that it doesn't interfere with other applications running in the same cluster because it's taking too many of the resources. There are four settings that you can enable in your deployments to limit how many resources applications are allowed to use and to guarantee a minimum of resources that the application needs to start. The CPU setting is measured in CPU units, which are equivalent to the number of cores. For example, one CPU unit is equal to one CPU core and the memory setting is just measured in bytes. For example, you can give your workload a limit of 512 megabytes of memory and to request 128 megabytes of memory. And of course, this all depends on how many resources the application needs and how many resources you have available on your nodes. And this is the reason why this is pretty complicated to set up because you first need to calculate all of this stuff. Honestly, I have no idea how to find that out. Yeah? <laughs> That's why I couldn't really fix this issue yet on my cluster because that needs further monitoring about the resources that are available and used by your apps. And it needs consistent adjustments based on the application needs and the traffic load. That's not easy. However, this is a topic that I'm really interested in. Maybe I'll take a look at this topic in the far future when I'm starting to learn more about monitoring and setting resources on Kubernetes clusters. But for now, I'm just happy to ignore this and let all the apps just run and take what they need. Finally, there's also another problem that was a bit easier to fix, luckily. <laughs> and that was the pinned tagged version check. So that checks whether you are using the latest tag in your container images or whether you're using a specific version. No, I sometimes do that on my containers in the home lab because I want to have them always up to date and I don't mind fixing problems that occur in newer versions. But honestly, it isn't a good practice. Yeah? You should never use any latest tags in your containers because you never know what was changed in a new version. For example, traffic already had some critical changes once they switched from version one to version two and that might break your existing configuration. So the recommendation is always use a specific version tag. This, by the way, should never be an issue on the Helm charts because they are mostly configured correctly, but I haven't really paid attention to the manifests of my Nginx deployments. So that is where I just replaced the tag latest with with the latest version tag of the Nginx container image and that fixed this problem. But these were basically all the problems that I could find and some of them I could already fix to increase their security. I'm just realizing we've probably just scratched the surface here yeah, and I probably need to invest more time to dig into these topics, especially the security settings and the resource limitations, because it's not easy. Actually, Kubernetes isn't easy, <laughs> but I don't think there is a good way around it. You just need to start somewhere and start looking into some of these topics. And for doing this, I found that tree is really a useful tool to get more visibility about what is going on in your clusters and explore new recommendations, security settings that you need to evaluate on your workloads. But I think that's it for today. I've covered enough topics and yeah as always thanks everybody for watching i will probably catch you in the next video take care bye bye